And now for our final presenter, Dan Sweeney. Dan is a mechanical engineer, research scientist, and lecturer at MIT's D-Lab. He's leading biomass fuel cook stove and air quality research. Biomass fuel is like stuff made from organic materials, plants, wood, crops, waste. And the D-Lab is um, a phenomenal program. Uh, our program was housed in D-Lab for a number of years. I got to know Dan and his colleagues and the students, just a fantastic group. Um, I saw a lot of Dan's prototypes <laughs> lying around of his cook stoves and stuff. Um, what they do is they're passionate researchers, ed educators, students focus on innovating through designing with communities, with communities in the developing world. And the emphasis on the with versus designing for is important. He'll get more into detail on that. It's in collaboration with organizations, social enterprises, and serving their communities for household energy products and services globally. Um, he did his PhD at the University of Utah, after which he moved to Sweden for a Fulbright scholarship focused on uh, development of advanced processes for converting biomass residues into energy and fuels. And uh, apparently you did cross-country skiing across the frozen Baltic <laughs> Sea? Oh, Occasionally, yeah. Is that a thing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah like the, the roads were impassable, so we had to yeah, ski, sounds amazing. ski to our lab. Yeah. <laughs> ski to the lab, okay. Um, he's active in the International Standards Organization Technical Committee on Clean Cooking Solutions and was a lead instructor for the 2016 International Development Design Summit on Cook Stoves in Kampala, Uganda. Apparently, he just got back from Uganda and had like a 62-hour yeah. travel. So if he's looking a little, no, you're looking sharp. It's <laughs> good. Um, he's from northern Colorado, where his family has a small farm. He loves rock climbing and folk music. And he's going to share a couple of case studies with you today. <laughs> Dan Sweeney. Cool. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Sweeney. Thanks, Tony, for that great in introduction. Uh, we're going to get a little bit lower tech um, compared to the last presentations. Those were really awesome. Um, but I still think this is really cool. And is this, yeah, is this all set up? So we're going to talk about what's cooking at MIT D-Lab. Um, I do a lot of work, as Tony mentioned, on cook stoves and the fuels that you use to cook, especially in low resource communities. Um, D-Lab works mostly in developing countries. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to focus on a couple of stories about uh, some projects that I'm working on right now with students. Um, we're going to take you mainly off campus. So uh, I'll show you kind of uh, how those are working. Um, like Tony mentioned, I grew up on a farm. There weren't a lot of other kids around. Uh, I discovered fire at a young age, and I was kind of a pyro. Don't worry. Um, I'm safe about it. But um, when I found out that D-Lab was looking for somebody with some background in combustion and fuels, um, I was really excited. So I joined the team about 10 years ago. If you're not familiar with D-Lab, uh, we work with people around the world to develop and advance collaborative approaches and practical solutions to global poverty challenges. We think a lot about who's on the design team. Um, here's our founder, Amy Smith. Uh, she's working with a group, I believe this is in Honduras, and um, one of our longtime partners, Carlos Marroquin, is there then uh, they're, I'm not sure what they were making in this picture, but they're using a lot of locally available materials. Um, so you can see bicycle parts, which you can pretty much find all over the world. And they uh, were making some agricultural tools. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor about what our work, our, our team members look like. Um, so we think about design in three ways. And as Tony mentioned, we really try to include local community members on the design team. So as opposed to you know, design four, where all of us are spending a lot of time in our workshops and our labs, designing technologies that we plan to introduce to the world, uh, we integrate closely with the community. We invite users who uh, live within the community or other stakeholders in that area to be a part of the team. So if you take a D-Lab class uh, at the end of the semester, we will spend a lot of time during the semester working on prototypes, learning about the context of designing technologies for people in low resource communities. But after that, we get out into the field. So during the January break and during the summer, uh, I regularly uh, accompany student teams um, and researchers to go to the field. So here's actually day one of one of our trips to Uganda to work with a 
community partner there, a social business that's making alternative fuels uh, for cooking, household cooking in Uganda. Um, so that looks a little bit different than what you might expect a regular MIT class to be doing. What we're doing here right now is we're digging our hands in deep to a big pile of what we call char. Uh, the team in Uganda made this char out of peanut shells. So they use the residue from um, agriculture that otherwise goes unused. They converted that into char by uh, firing it in a low oxygen environment. And now what we're doing is we're mixing it with a binder made from um, a local root vegetable that makes a really sticky porridge. Then what they'll do is they'll press that into a fuel, a little briquette, kind of like what we barbecue with, and then take it out into the market for sale. So I'm not gonna talk about this project. There's actually a TED talk Amy Smith did uh, long back um, where you can learn more about it. Um, so here's a, a graph and I won't go into a lot of detail, but this kind of, uh, I think summarizes well why we should think about um, uh, household cooking and why household cooking plays such a big role in the energy and sustainability scene in rural villages especially. So what we're looking at here is a snapshot of energy supplies and the end uses. And this pertains to a rural village in West Africa. I think this was in Mali. Um, this was some colleagues at ASU who did this research. I think it was really cool because they followed all of these different energy supplies and where they ended up being used over the course of the year. So you can see, you know, there's a little bit of electricity, charcoal plays a little role, petroleum probably for transportation, but whoa, there's a big circle up there for wood, right? And most of that wood goes over into the other big bubble is domestic uses. Uh, the major thing being cooking. Um, so this really, I think, emphasizes that uh, sustainability and energy challenges are at the forefront and the way that people are dealing with those now is um, largely using wood. Um, I think another interesting thing here is you look at the top up there you'll see a number 6,000 megajoules per capita per year. You don't have to know what all that means um, but each person in the village uses about 6,000 megajoules. Um, we can compare that I think I put the R, R figure for the US down below. So one of us represents about 50 of these villagers in terms of our energy consumption. I think that's also really important for sustainability. Um, so that kind of emphasizes our work in the biomass fuels and cook stoves group. We have a small team. There's some of us here today. And uh, here's a couple of our current projects. So um, a lot of people have focused on this challenge over the past 50 years. This is actually in Guatemala and mucho gusto nuestros amigos de Guatemala. I know we have some friends here. Um, this is a, a woman cooking traditionally. She's making tortillas on what's called a comal, I think, I hope I'm saying it right. And she has three kind of big stones uh, or bricks that she's placed the comal on top of. This is a very common scene in rural Guatemala and also rural areas uh, around the developing world. People have been working on this for a long time and they tend to have just focused on one part of it the cook stove. Uh, we do things a little bit differently at D-Lab. Um, so what others have done in designing new stoves, kind of following a one size fits all, right? They design and mass manufacture stoves, maybe in India or China, then disseminate those all around the world in hopes that people will uh, have a better experience when they're cooking. They'll be exposed to less smoke. Um, and they'll use less firewood. So we have a lot of these sustainability goals in mind. But what we've come back and found when you visit those communities again, you often find that people have reverted back to their traditional way of cooking. And my thought is probably that's because they, the designers, the engineers making those one size fits all solutions haven't really thought about the other factors here, especially the tortillas. <laughs> um, so our team at D-Lab, we think that by having users and local business people, local researchers and students on our design team, we will be able to better address the overall picture here and meet the needs of, of this woman. So let's go to the Himalaya. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on now is called Himalayan Home Energy. And uh, I'm gonna just share an experience from this project. Uh, we took a trip, we took students, uh, from one of the D-Lab classes, D-Lab Energy, 
uh, to a couple of villages in the Himalaya. This is one of those villages in the northern Indian state of Uttarakhand. This is a place called Pata. Uh, it's very beautiful. It takes a really long time to get there, and we do a lot of walking up and down along with our uh, community partners there. So this was uh, the team in Pata at that time. On the left, we have some MIT folks, some students. Uh, Robin in the red shirt is a master's student. You could actually do a master's with D-Lab if you're interested. Um, I'm right there. We have a couple of Indian academics, a PhD student and a professor. And then the two people standing on either side of me are the local, there's the local leader, the Gram Panchayat, that's the guy. And then Savitri, she's a local uh, women's group leader. Who do you think was uh, the most effective and influential in terms of our design project that we did in Pata? Anybody have a guess? Well, if you were thinking Savitri, then you're right. Um, even though we came with all these academics, people with big degrees, uh, Savitri is, has very little ed formal education, but she lives and breathes these challenges every single day. So what we started out doing with Savitri is we, she showed us her kitchen. Um, this is what it looks like. She has a traditional stove called a chulha, uh, which is made out of mud and brick. Um, she cooks all of her family's meals on that chulha. You may also notice in her kitchen, she has a cylinder of cooking gas. And in India, a lot of uh, even rural families have cooking gas, but it's very difficult to refill. It can be very expensive. The cylinders don't always come back, so Savitri she really prefers cooking with her chula, and especially because of the nice flavors that come out. So again, coming to a one-size-fits-all cooking solution for Savitri is going to be difficult. Um, so what we decided to do is meet Savitri in the middle. She had her own ideas about what could be, uh, make the experience of cooking better for her. And we came with some engineering and design knowledge and an understanding of fire, combustion, ventilation. Um, and so we worked with her together on improving her stove. So Sucheta here is doing a, what we call a water boil test. Very exciting sounding test. Essentially, we measure the emissions and the efficiency of the stove before and after we do the retrofit. Uh, you can see Sucheta was really struggling here, right? This kitchen was very smoky when, when we cooked with the chulha. So Sabitri taught us how to make local stoves. And kind of like when we got our hands dirty with char in Uganda, she brought a, a big basin of cow dung and some grass and some clay, and our whole team got our hands dirty in that. This was really nice, fresh cow dung. That's the best for making cook stoves. Um, so then we thought we knew a few things about how to improve conditions in the kitchen. And one of the best ways you can do it is like what we do here. If you have a fireplace or a wood stove at home, you have a chimney that takes the smoke out. So we taught Savitri and some of the others in her women's group how to make chimneys. So you can see us here riveting together some sheet metal. Then Savitri and our team rebuilding her chula so that we can fit it with a chimney and doing over the course of a, a few days, tweaking that design and making sure that enough of the heat from the fire was going into the cooking, we came up with a neat solution that was relatively low cost, could be made from local materials. Um, and we found that it increased efficiency and the conditions in the kitchen improved so much that even the children and other family members felt comfortable to stay in there. Um, so uh, that was one of the projects. I'm gonna talk about one more now and this takes us to another continent, Africa, and in West Africa, Cameroon. This is the cutest part of the presentation. <laughs> um, so this project, uh, it's supported through support from the Jamil Water and Food Systems Lab. It's called the Off-Grid Brooder. And it's uh, one of the latest things that we're working on in our group. Um, so what we're focused on here is uh, poultry farming. Do we have any poultry farmers here? Okay, um, if you, so I, I didn't know much about poultry farming um, other than, you know, uh, it's kind of stinks, there's a lot of feathers and you don't want to spend a lot of time in poultry farms, but that's something now that I've done, having visited Cameroon a couple times. For small poultry farmers, especially in developing countries, they struggle because the chicks need a heat source when they're very young. So for about the first two or three weeks, they need to be at a very specific temperature, around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. 
If you go above or below that, the chance of the chicks not surviving increases a lot. And so for these small farmers that are raising a lot of chicks, uh, they can take great losses. Um, poultry farmers in Cameroon are very amazing, interesting people. They actually live in this room with the chicks for the first two weeks of the chick's life. They stay in there pretty much 24 seven because they're so concerned about the chicks. They're also concerned about their financial sustainability, right? Their livelihood. Taking a loss on a, a, a batch of chicks means that they don't earn income. They won't be able to sell these uh, on the market. And that means they may not be able to send their children to school, a whole host of other challenges that can come from that. So there's a lot on, line with these little bird, on the line with these little birds. The way that most poultry farmers maintain a high temperature in, their, uh, in the chick's room or the environment here is by burning firewood. So you can see a piece of, big piece of firewood up there. Uh, if the firewood, again, doesn't burn very well, it'll, like in Savitri's kitchen, it'll produce a lot of smoke that also can be harmful to the chicks. So we heard from a lot of farmers that they take big losses uh, due to smoke or when the conditions got too hot or cold. So we got to thinking, you know, what are some things that we can do uh, to help these small poultry farmers? So we went with a team uh, and we teamed up our D-Lab Energy group and also a, a local organization called African Solar Generation, really great team based in Yaoundé in Cameroon. Uh, African Solar Generation had developed a technology for keeping the chicks warm using solar energy, kind of like the photovoltaics on the, the Nimbus car. So they used panels, the panels produced electricity that ran a heating lamp inside the brooder, uh, the box where the chicks are. But the challenge was is each one of those systems was about $1,500. Um, and we learned that most poultry farmers are only maybe earning $20 to $30 of profit uh, per month. So it's a long time to pay off. Most of them can't afford it. So we worked with ASG to think about how do we take the solar panels out of the equation. Um, and so Ali and Katana are two D-Lab students and they're talking to a group of Cameroonian poultry farmers that we met. And we introduced a new idea um, that came from some other D-Lab projects in the use of what are called phase change materials. Um, so that sounds pretty fancy and high tech, but we found a really cool phase change material locally, and that's beeswax. So what that means is when we heat up the beeswax and we melt it, it, as it solidifies in with the chicks, it slowly releases heat at about the right temperature that uh, baby chicks like. Um, and it can actually go for long enough that it keeps the chicks warm at least overnight, and maybe a little longer. The farmers were really excited. They said, ah, this will be great. You know, this seems safe. We can do it locally. Um, so we, we taught them how to use thermal batteries. And we built a prototype of a, an off-grid brooder. So the bottom panel comes off and you put the thermal batteries inside. The chicks live in the top area. This is kind of a small scale version. The farmers thought it was also really important that they could see the chicks. So we put a window in there. Um, and this project is ongoing. We're working on a new iteration of it, uh, but it's very promising. The main challenge some of you may be thinking about is how do you melt the beeswax? So for now, uh, the initial tests we've done, we use firewood, but we're working on a solution that actually you can use uh, solar energy not to make electricity, but as a, a heat source to melt the wax. Um, so that's the off-grid brooder, and that's the end of my presentation. Thanks.